Welcome to People Potential with Amanda. Thank you for listening in today. I'm your host, Amanda Flacing, and I'll be bringing on various experts to discuss empowering individuals and organizations to achieve their full potential. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of People Potential with Amanda. Today's guest is Tonil Miller. She's a global transformation and people experience leader, the founder of EXT, and transformation practice leader at Outreach. Tonil also has an impressive amount of corporate experience. She's former global VP, uh, culture employee experience and leadership development at StarTech, and former senior manager of transformational change at PwC for many years. So hey, Tonil, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Amanda. I appreciate it. Let's jump right into things. So as an experienced people leader or a people experience leader, um, I'd love to know your thoughts on if and how the employee experience has become a priority for employers now. Where do you see that going in the future of corporate work? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks again for having me. Um, The other thing I'd love to kick our conversation off with before I dive into that topic is just to let everyone know that um, any views or opinions that I express on today's show are really not affiliated with any clients I have, and they're really just my own views. So I just want to get that part out of the way. Um, But knowing that, um, to answer your question, I think first it might be important to really define what employee experience is, because I think a lot of folks have different um, understandings of it, different views of it, that type of thing. And so for me, the way that I define it is, you know, it goes beyond culture, technology, physical space, and even beyond the employee life cycle, which is what some people think it really is. And then, you know, it really starts the moment, I believe anyways, uh, a candidate has first heard of your organization to, you know, when they think about your brand in the marketplace, to when they start looking at you on Glassdoor, Uh, the interviewing, onboarding experience, the way you grow and develop them, uh, how you offboard them. And then also when you think about once they leave your organization, it's also how you interact with them as an alum. And and so in all those moments that matter that we'd like to talk about in between all of those things I just said. So it's all that stuff together. So it's very holistic. It's very all encompassing. And I think, you know, for the most part, it's, it's like your customer experience in some ways, in the sense that it's every minute people are engaged with your organization and how it makes them feel. So you want to really think about it as strategically as you do when you design the customer experience, because you're really designing that time that people spend with your organization. Um, One thing I would love to call out, if you don't mind, is just I like to ground everything in data. And so one thing that I think is an important point to pull in here is Josh Burson, who I'm sure most of you are all familiar with, uh, released a study, I think it was a few months ago, and found that, you know, a great employee experience, and this is why it's so important, right? So it produces three times more innovation and change agility. It produces five times the engagement, uh, I think five times the retention, and then the belonging, the feeling of belonging of people in the organization, as well as twice as high of customer satisfaction and revenue. So when you think about it, like those are really important metrics and numbers that organizations and leaders are chasing. And so if you think about it, wow, if you thought of one silver bullet, I think you, employee experience literally would be would be one of it. So I'm going to pause there and just see if you have any questions or thoughts yeah, on that part yeah, of it. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you brought in some metrics. And uh, we'll link to um, Josh Person's research Mm -hmm. uh, in the show notes. But that's such a great way for HR leaders to position themselves at the executive table by bringing these ROI metrics to the table and explaining here's the effect that all of our work on the employee experience can have. Mm -hmm. And um, different people react to different things. And many leaders will react more, much more strongly to quantitative Uh, data like this versus uh, more qualitative data. And and we all have the feeling that, yes, of course, the employee experience is great, but with some numbers to back it up, uh, it makes that so much stronger. It makes those proposals for new programs and funding those programs much more compelling. I think so too. And it's interesting too, because again, we like to ground everything both. I love that you called out the quantitative and the qualitative. And, you know, I think even pre-pandemic, I think organizations were already realizing the importance of the employee experience for various reasons. And then, you know, but at the same time, 
I think the pandemic, as we all know, and we've all talked about this so much, has really just been that forcing function to really pay more attention to that type of thing and that sort of thing. And in the fact that like work serves a different purpose for people today, right? And so, and their expectations are higher. They have choices, like all these other different trends that are happening are also part of why this is so important. Um, and so the one thing though, that I think is that a lot of organizations don't either understand employee experience that well, and, or they don't do it very well. And that's, again, I know it's a very complicated and complex topic in some ways, really it is. Um, but I think a good place to start just rule of thumb for organizations is just be as deliberate, again, as, as I mentioned, Mentioned about designing and nurturing it as they do the customer experience. And so then when you think about like customer experience, it's like all those great tools that we have in our toolkit, like branding, persona development, journey mapping, uh, measuring satisfaction scores and that sort of thing. So that we're in the heads of our customers that we attract nurture and retain them, we'd want to apply those same principles and a lot of those same tools to our employee experience and building that. So I think that might be like a great place for some organizations to start if they haven't. Absolutely. Partner with your marketing team and work on all of that so that you have an integrated and cohesive brand experience, whether it's from the employee perspective or the customer perspective. These are all these stakeholders are touching your brand and their experience with, with you as a brand, as a company, and what you're putting out in the world. And I love that you pointed out it's not just one, the employee experience also includes the pre-employment and then that post-employment, how, how do you interact with those alum? And so often people end up coming back or they interact with us in different ways. They can become clients or partners or, you know, you never know. Yeah, it's so true. And I love that you brought that up because I think the, the organizations who do this really well, and I've been part of some of them, I've worked with and for some of them. They think about it as an ecosystem, right? So exactly what you said. It's not just, oh, we got to get the talent in the door and then make sure we get the best out of them while we're while they're with us. Well, that's great, but like there's a lot more to it than that. And I love the whole, um, you know, maybe people won't stay forever in your organization, but to your point that you made, they may boomerang back, and that's a great thing. But if you didn't give them a great offboarding and or alumni experience, that's not going to probably happen. So I think it's great to keep that holistic picture in mind. And that's absolutely like the future of work, the gig economy. It's mm -hmm. less, those are less popular topics today than they were maybe three years ago, but they are still very relevant. And that brings me to my second question. So a lot of leaders are now encouraged to really invest in their employees and their professional development. Uh, so this could be from like increasing salaries as soon as possible when it's rightfully deserved or paying for trainings and courses and so much more. But then we have some leaders like, what do we say to them when they feel apprehensive to do things like this or to invest too much because they don't want to risk anything or risk over investing in case the employee leaves? So, yeah, it's, I it's mean, the question is like, what if, what if they leave, but what, but what if they stay or what if mm -hmm. the ecosystem? So, so what do you, uh, what do you say to those kind of, to the leaders that are just a bit worried? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And first of all, I want to call out that I think it's it's a valid concern, right? I understand it's it's um, expensive to onboard and develop people and do all these different things. I totally get why leaders are a little apprehensive about it, but I got a couple data points that I would say. I would say, um, first of all, today's talent, especially top talent, if you're not growing and developing them, they will leave full stop. No question. Just know that right away. Um, and they're looking to gain skills. They're looking to gain experience and, you know, really be a better person when they leave the organization, especially the more younger colleagues, right? Because they don't have those years of experience under their belt. They're just craving it. So for that's one thing to think about. And then there's the other question of, you know, what's worse for the organization, even selfishly as an organization, someone who stays and is stifled, not developing, unengaged, their skills are kind of, you know, eroding that sort of thing, or someone that you're developing Developing, and yeah, they might leave you, but again, they may come back and or they're going to do the best work they possibly can while they are there. So I think that that kind of just lays a little bit of that out. And then the other part that I would offer as a solution to some of these leaders and organizations is, you know, there's a lot of really inexpensive, inexpensive slash free ways to develop people that actually also moves the organization's goals um, forward. And so I'll give you a couple of these examples. So um, first of all, they don't, today's workforce, you know, Gen Z millennials, I think we all know that like, 
they don't really learn from that. Send me to three days of, you know, an offsite training that's really expensive. And I sit in a, in a conference room for, you know, all day for the three days. And it's, you know, just a lecture and it's boring. No, they don't learn that way. And, and it's just, it's not helping anybody. And that's where the expense usually comes in, things like that. And so how they do learn is like um, snackable bite-sized videos. There's so much like free content on LinkedIn and yeah. on YouTube and all in Google. It's, it's out there. So it's like, that's free and or super inexpensive and it's how they learn better. So there's that piece to consider. Um, the other part is, you know, I always talk about learning in the flow of work, right? So it's not just, oh, here's another three days at training I got to take off work for or whatever. It's like, let's do some cross mentoring. Let's do like up, down, all around lateral mentoring of each other. That's a great way to learn. And you're pushing the organization's goals forward. Um, expanded career experiences like apprenticeships, internal marketplaces, stretch assignments, all these things are developing the people that cost basically nothing. And you're like move, getting more bandwidth with out of them and upskilling them. And I actually have an example when I was at StarTech, I had a wonderful leadership development team. And um, what we what they had is they had started this wonderful apprentice program. So there were certain people in the organization that their job was totally unrelated. It might have been like sales or it was, you know, something over here in HR, but they really wanted to learn um, graphic design or, you know, how to deliver different um, courses, instructor led training, things like that. They wanted to learn these skills. And so we had this apprentice program where they could, you know, say, hey, I've got an extra five hours this week or three hours or whatever. And so they would actually be like helping the business because they were kind of, as they were learning from the people that were doing that work, that were the experts, they could take on some of the projects and some of the bandwidth and they were growing and expanding. And so it was really like this wonderful win-win solution. Um, the last thing I would highlight as a great way to do this is just something as simple as cultivating a culture of curiosity, a growth mindset, psychological safety, and experimentation, because all those things are ways we are learning in the flow of work, and it doesn't cost anything. So I'll stop there, but like those are some really powerful things that I've seen work well. I love that you got so practical and gave like real examples of what companies could do today. And I saw in there some examples for larger companies or for smaller companies. And then the third one, really creating that space. Um, brings me to my third question, actually. So I want to talk a bit more about company culture and maybe creating that culture of curiosity uh, and all of that. So we recently published at SuccessFinder an ebook, The Art of Improving Company Culture. So available for download at successfinder.com. And what we're trying to share here is that company culture can in fact be bettered and made to paint a more accurate portrait of the organization and then leveraged to create an awesome employee experience. Like it's part of the employer branding, it's part of the experience and it's part of creating that experience that helps you retain your people and keep them engaged and successful in their roles. So in your experience, where do you think companies struggle with improving culture? And you know, like a, I mean, I think it's obvious to me, but maybe you've seen, why should they even care about culture? Have you had to convince clients first to care about it? And then after, you know, help them see what, what are their struggles? What are they really struggling with, with culture? Yes. We could have a whole podcast about this alone. Um, First of all, I'll throw another data point out there. So new research, I forget if it was Harvard or MIT, but it just came out and it says that 92%, I think 92% of leaders today know the importance of culture, right? They understand the impact. So that's good. That's more than I was expecting. Um, but only 16% of them say that they're willing to do anything about it because they think it's too complicated or too time consuming. And this is a big disconnect. It's leaving a ton of money, energy, productivity, and really organizational effectiveness on the table is, is how I feel about that. And so luckily there's a lot of options to get around this, right? So again, I understand if a leader isn't a culture expert, they don't have to be, that's not necessarily their job, but there's options, right? So like, for example, it's for me, as, as someone who's done this work across various industries and organizations, all sides, Sizes. Um, I can tell you it's not complicated, but it's it does require leaders to be aligned, uh, intentional, and vigilant. And so I think I say that because I think one of the misconceptions about culture is that it's the office. This is one we hear a lot, especially right now. Um, and to be honest, this is not true. And so culture is simply it's the collective understanding of what's acceptable amongst a group of people, right? So it's like that the lifestyle of your organization that governs how people interact with each other, how things get done, what behaviors they tolerate. And that transcends the physical space, right? So for example, 
you know, whether somebody is at a client site or they're at a work happy hour, or they may be sending an email on the train on the way home, or they're working from home, they're demonstrating your culture in all those settings in the ways that they're working with each other and interacting with each other. Um, I think another misconception I see quite a bit is that the culture is the values on the wall or the values in the PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and um, I actually worked for one organization at one point in time that I had as a client, and they literally almost verbatim said, well, here's our culture presentation. That's our culture. That's it. You know, we just picked out the words and that's it. Um, and I understand, again, they're not experts in this. So, of course, I totally understand that side of it. But this is also not the case, right? Unless, unless the caveat is if every single person lives those words and values in their behavior impeccably all day, every day, wherever they are, then it could be your culture. But that would be the only time. And that doesn't always happen. In fact, most of the time it doesn't. And so what I would say is I think culture really operationalizes the true values of your organization, what you truly value. And that may or may not have anything to do with those words on the wall. And so that's why you really need, that's why it's so important to be so deliberate about designing it, auditing it, monitoring it, that sort of thing. Um, and and I, I use the word vigilant. I think vigilant is actually almost the right word because it's literally moment to moment, like the ego system. It's, it's a living and breathing thing your culture is. And so like if new people come to the organization or if people leave or the business strategy changes or something else happens, like your culture is changing moment to moment. And so you got to really kind of always be monitoring it and be vigilant. And so that's why um, I think I put so much emphasis on that piece of it. Absolutely. Uh, depending on if you're a high growth company and you grow by 30%, your culture is changing. You have new people there. It's not the same uh, makeup as it was. And then basing your culture, what we like to say is really in data, in behavioral data, like who are your people really? Who are they now? And then what do you aspire to be? So your values could be more aspirational or could be really truly lived if you've done the research of like who deep research and creating those values and the description of those values and making sure that's really who you are and living and breathing it. So there's different ways. But so there are those two portions, like, so the real, like the empirical data of who your people really are, and then the aspirational data, and then how do you merge them both together? And that's what we do with our culture impact benchmark. Um, so it's, and then we recommend to like, if you're growing or you're having so many fluctuations, it's a hundred percent living and breathing. You need to redo that benchmark whenever relevant. Exactly. And I think one of the interesting things we're seeing now, and again, to your question, leaders know it's important, right? But again, it's like you have to kind of get them past that knowing and doing gap that we call in psychology, the knowing and doing gap. It's like, I know what's what to do, but I'm not actually doing it. And I think one of the interesting things is, like you said, when we start bringing data into the picture and they can see how that impacts their bottom line. So for example, I think the, the metric right now that they've rated it at is like bad cultures cost companies around $15,000 per year per employee. So if your culture isn't great, this should really be a top priority. And then I think the other interesting study that came out in the last few months was from MIT and they found, you know, the largest predictor of the great resignation is a toxic work culture. I think we've all seen this report. And so that includes things like, you know, managers not listening or not recognizing their people or politics, bullying, and it can go all the way down to, you know, discrimination, harassment, exclusion, disrespect. Like there's a lot of, it, it's like a whole spectrum, right? It can be small yeah. little things that can go all the way to these really horrible things. And so you understand why it gets to be really, really important and really, really expensive. And then the last thing I think I'd say about this is is that, you know, th that there's that saying culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think not only is that true, but it's like a vast understatement because it's going to make or break your organization. You can have the best strategy, the best product, the best clients, whatever. But if your people aren't all rowing in the same direction, collaborating, working well, and, you know, productive and happy to be there and really just like fluid in that way, it does not matter what that strategy is. And so that's why I think, you know, things like psychological safety, um, you know, again, the things you mentioned earlier, the growth mindset, that kind of stuff, that's so important in recognition as well. So it's, it's just, it's those things that, they're not fluffy, but I think they used to be termed as fluffy. And now we're seeing the hard data behind it. And I just hope that people catch up because it's so important. It is so, so, so important. I think the more people, the more we talk about it, the better it is. And the more we, you know, 
promote the stats behind this. Mm -hmm. And it's so closely tied to that employee experience. Yeah. So your culture is your experience at mm -hmm. uh, one, when you're an employee. And then you remember that as you leave and, and are in the ecosystem. So it, it's all fluid. It all goes together. Mm -hmm. And it's all extremely impactful to the success of an organization. Very much so. So to wrap things up today, I'm going to ask you my signature question on this podcast, okay. which is how do you unleash your own potential? Really good question. I like that a lot. Um, I think for me, I, I, I realized recently in a conversation with a, with a friend that this is an odd thing about me. I don't know if others do this or not, but I guess I've always just been so hungry for knowledge for a lot of reasons. And so I think the five ways that I kind of do this is like, I'm always curious about myself, like just learning more about myself and like being present and mindful and self-aware um, and always curious about other people too. And like how they tick and why this is that way and why they're that way. And you know, that kind of thing. So just always kind of doing those, those uh, thought experiments, if you will. And then I have this, like always be learning kind of mindset. Like I'm constantly devouring podcasts and books and articles and just talking to new and interesting people and just really trying on different ways of like mental and like cognitive flexibility and taking different perspectives and that sort of thing. So I kind of like try those, like I said, those kind of mental experiments all the time. Um, and then just in general in life too, I just always have that, you know, curious experimental mindset, right? So whether it's work, whether it's personal life, whatever it is, I'm always like, Hmm, how could we try this here? Right. So then it's like, nothing is a failure. Nothing is anything negative like that. It's always learning and always codifying the lessons learned from the experiences as you go. And then, you know, iterating and maybe making different choices going forward based on what you're learning and that type of thing. And so that's kind of the, the personal approach I take to myself, but it's also an approach that I take in my work. It's very much that iterative kind of agile mindset. Absolutely. I was about to say a very agile mindset. <laughs> And, and I think the good, news, the good news is like, that's what we need in today's world, whether it's personally Absolutely. or professionally. So I'm glad that I somehow had this from the time I was younger. That's awesome. So Neil, thank you so much for uh, joining me today and uh, really appreciate it. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. Thanks for joining us on People Potential with Amanda. I appreciate each and every single listen and view. If you've enjoyed this content, it would really mean the world if you could leave us a five-star review. This will make a huge impact in increasing the visibility of this podcast on top of brightening the day of a few people here at Success Finder who work really hard behind the scenes to make this all happen. We're continuously working on new episodes, so be sure to hit the subscribe button so you won't miss a thing. Until next time. Stay curious.